this photo appeared, it's on the uh, University of Iowa uh, Historical Society website. Uh, they hired, I think it was Ron Sims, went around the state and took a lot of pictures at depots. And that little dark colored building in the middle of the photo would be the McCallsburg Depot or train register or whatever it would be. But off to the right is the most peculiar looking thing that I think I've ever seen. And I wondered for a long time, just what the heck is that? Um, I knew it was probably something to do with, with coal, but I wasn't sure. So that's where we'll start, is trying to figure out just what that is. One correct uh, question. What's interesting, I'm gonna go back. This photo was yeah, taken. One yes. One correction. That photo is from the John Vandermas collection of depot photos, which was donated to the University of Iowa Historical Library. Thank you. Yes. Yes, you are correct. I know Ron Sims took some, but he, not he this provided collection. a lot of the photos. Yes. But yeah. Okay. John, John Vandermas is the one who collected them. He was from Muscatine, Iowa. Okay. Great. But anyway, what's interesting is if you look at this, this is in 1956 under St. L ownership, albeit under the command of uh, Heinemann. Boo. And this is <laughs> after the merger. <laughs> and notice how the, much cleaner the track is. You can actually see how terrible the ties are. Um, not sure when this photo was taken, um, but what's interesting about it is they've cited over what I'll call the office. It was blocked in the first photo you can see here. And this one, it has siding on it. Uh, they've also started to use the coal bunkers for fertilizer. And they have a, an auger there for unloading uh, fertilizer from cars and putting it into those bins. But there's still a drag conveyor for coal in the open area between what I'll call the office and uh, the shed. So you have to be careful what you pick. Uh, this is a photo that I took uh, maybe a year or two ago. Uh, we stopped by there uh, purposely to take some photos and to kind of step off some crude dimensions. Uh, the pathway in, uh, in the foreground would have been where the main line was, now a walking trail. Uh, this is a corner with one of the posts that uh, would have went up that held that I-beam been cut off. Here's another view showing that slab where the office was and outside coal storage. You can see one of the poles at the other end of the building is still up. Uh, and there's another shed at the other end. This is a crude sketch. I probably made four sketches in my entire career. Uh, this is one of the four. Um, this is as good as it gets for me making any kind of drawings. This is a photo that Doug took of the inside of one of the bins where it shows you the size of the original opening in the wall and then the roof for loading coal into the space. This is Doug's drawing. The dimensions are different than mine, which isn't surprising at all. This is a Vincent Mart aerial photo. In this photo, you can Ooh, still see yeah. uh, coal in that area in between what I'll call the office and the shed and still coal in uh, the first shed uh, uh, bin and that little bit of a station setting up there. So to get started with this thing, I took uh, evergreen corrugated. I think it's, uh, I can't remember the number right offhand. Uh, not important, it's just their evergreen corrugated and evergreen, uh, I think it's probably 40,000 sick. And then I took evergreen uh, plain 40,000s. And I used that along the bottom for the sides and the ends uh, and the back also. This shows some reinforcing that I did between the, the concrete and the corrugated walls. Uh, to hold things together when I cut out the openings for uh, putting the coal in. Uh, here's the roof and the side. 
uh, with the openings, as you can see, there was a spot where the roof broke in two, but I've had to glue it back together again. <coughs> when I got ready to cover up the openings, I figured I had some uh, corrugated uh, tin, maybe some uh, Campbell's around. But what I found was I had two packages of this corrugated roofing. It's a, well, you can read, it's a paper product. Uh, it's by uh, Wild West uh, Scale Model Builders. I believe I probably picked this up over at Trade Fest from one of the vendors over there, but it worked out quite well for covering the, the openings in the roof. I'm going to put those posts on now, hold the, the I-beam up uh, to get some kind of a measurement. You can see I've actually used a ruler, shame on me. Um, the, the little flag that's under the top of the, of the six by eight post is just for a, a spacer. It's not gonna, it's just there to hold the post level. Now I've, I've I drilled a hole uh, where I want those posts to go. And then I've carved them out into a rectangle that's uh, an angled rectangle. You know, there's always, every time you're gonna do a project, there's always something about that project that gives you pause. And for me, the, the biggest concern I had of building this whole thing was how I was gonna put those posts on. Was I going to just butt them up against the roof and have them fall off? Or was I going to try and do what I'm doing and get them through the roof and make it so there wasn't giant holes where the where the posts were going to go through? Uh, this is what I came up doing, and it actually is not too bad. So now, when you look at this, I'm wondering to myself, why didn't I put the supports on the top of the post? And the <laughs> I never thought of it, but I probably would have knocked them off in handling anyway. So it's just as good I didn't put them on. Um, I added a couple of extra stiffeners of 80 thousandths uh, styrene in the middle. You can see I've uh, I put uh, doors on that are made out of car siding, and I've used some scraps of the corrugated to hold those in place. Those uh, 125 by 125 pieces laying there are for corner supports. You can that opening, if you look into it, you can see where uh, the probably two by sixes or two by eights uh, were on either side of those openings. So I put some in, this would be on the, on the roof section. There's three pieces there and the same on the wall section. Now I don't, I do some measuring because I have to, but I avoid it at all costs. The Z bracing on the inside of that door, I cut one piece of the vertical or the horizontal to length, then cut the other two to that size, glued them on, then cut the two diagonal pieces and glued those in place without moving the other ones. So I figured if my eye goes bad, I quit modeling. Now I've got, I'm using the ruler as a straight edge so I can put the posts in place and have them all come up to the same height. So it's just basic, I've got one more to put on, bring it up so it, it matches the straight edge and then uh, glue it in place. Uh, this is that uh, concrete platform that the office and that uh, other open area will be on. I think I mismeasured this one. is a little larger than it probably is going to end up. Somebody needs to mute themselves. Oh, wait. Anyway, I have it setting up here backwards. Uh, and you can see that I ran out whatever I used for uh, uh, the base to raise that uh, 80 thousandths up. I didn't have quite enough and there's a little bit of a gap. But that's going to be on the backside anyway. Uh, now that what I'll call the sack house, the, the, the structure at the end that was obviously used to, to store bags of probably lime, cement, uh, feed, fertilizer, anything they wanted to keep dry. Um, and you can see here I have done some measuring. Um, 
uh, marked off the, the uh, left and right ends. Here I'm actually using a straight edge. I'm gonna cut that portion off of the sheet. And then basically it's a scribe and snap Hello. to get uh, the, the, the pieces I want and the scraps that could be used later for inside supports. Then some wind, some straight edges to try and make the thing square, which is harder than you would think. You can see the thing is sets up on some concrete pilings that run the length of the building, just like tall footings. So I use 80,000 styrene I had laying around. I cut and scribed and snapped some strips and put on the bottom. And that's also an 80,000 floor I put in there. I had to put that in in order to have something to glue those uh, footings too. Um, I put a door track side uh, so they could unload into it. It's a, basically a piece of car siding that's probably eight by eight. Across the top, I put a piece of uh, probably 20 thousandths by 20 thousandths. And then over the top of that, I put a piece of what looks to be 10 thousandths by 60 thousandths or somewhere in that neighborhood. And then a piece of uh, along the bottom and, and the handle on the door from the scrap bin. Uh, here I've got uh, the, the shed or the, excuse me, the office has been double coated with uh, uh, craft paint mixture of browns and grays, tans and grays. And I've airbrushed my mix of, uh, of uh, galvanized on the shed and and the, the shack or the sh both, both buildings, they're both the same color <laughs> and the lighting makes them look different. I Somebody asked me once what my formula was for galvanizing and I had no answer because I use Floquil silver and a Floquil gray of some kind. And as the bottle gets low, I add more. So it's, there's the match, it's never the same. Now I've gone, I've taken some Floquil, um, uh, I think it's uh, Harbor Miss Gray, and painted all the wood um, door, doors with that. And I'm also going to use a little lighter gray on those two. Here I've splotched some onto the door on the shed. Now I'm, uh, I, while that's drying, I decided to make uh, the supports for that I beam. And I probably made three jigs in my entire life ever, uh, but I felt I needed to make one to have these things all turn out fairly close to the same size. Now I've glued them on. And also, if you look at the, at the top, you'll see there's water on this thing. Because what I've done is I've, after I, I sprayed on the galvanized and painted the doors, I painted them with AK Interactive heavy chipping. When that dried, I used Tamiya white acrylic paint and painted the sides and the ends with that. When that dried, I dunked everything under the faucet and wetted everything, and then came back with some 220 grit sandpaper and made vertical stripes um, over the sides to uh, chip off some of that uh, white paint to give it that worn look. Mark, what did you call the paint? Heavy chipping? Yes, heavy chipping, uh, AK Interactive, heavy chipping. They also make a worn, um, and they may make more than that, but that's the two that I buy. Okay, that's pretty um, cool. Yeah, it works really good. The, the, I don't, I'm not an acrylic per, paint person, and I think I may have had the, the, the AK Interactive on a little thick because you can see the paint kind of crackled a little bit, but that kind of adds to the flavor. That's but fine. on the ends, I, I left that, I, I didn't go up clear to the eaves because that paint uh, under the eaves would have stayed better than, than lower yeah. on the side. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it, it works good on wood and you can use a knife blade to scrape it off. Yeah. Um, this would be the, the door on that shed. Now here I've, I'm, uh, I've also gone over 
dry brushed on a little bit of uh, craft paint. And I painted on the doors and I painted a, a coat on the concrete uh, footings or bottom of the, of the shed and the footings of the, of the small shed. You can see I have craft paint mix there, which is tans and grays mixed together. And now I'm putting a wash on the roof, uh, a rust colored wash. Uh, you can see I use what, a color called chestnut and an orange and a dark red, and that's Windex in the, in the cup. And I put a wash on the roof and I'll put a black wash on after this, this uh, rust colored uh, wash dries. This is just a piece of uh, carved ceiling tile. And now it's a lump of coal. I basically hit it with some uh, uh, white glue and then dip coal uh, drizzled over the top of it. Uh, I put a shelf on the inside of that open end and give everything some black uh, uh, craft paint. And then I set that lump of coal in there, glued it in. And then those boards across the bottom of that opening are, are one of the sunshine um, uh, grain doors that I cut in two and stacked up and put across there. <laughs> now we got the, we, the base is a, is a given size for uh, the area that it's going to go. Um, and what I've done is I've set the, the buildings on the base, drawn around them, so I know what the, what the footprint is. I've also added a strip on there for uh, that sidewalk that may have had something to do with the unloading. I'm not sure. Um, and the black, is paint my numbers here. Uh, the black is where the structure will go. Uh, the gray is where gravel will go. And uh, the brown is where dirt will go. So here I've used, on the top photo, I, I painted on some uh, uh, diluted glue and then uh, salt went through a salt shaker. I put gravel over the top of that. Once that dried uh, on the bottom, I, I also put on um, dirt. And then over the top of the dirt, I've added some more diluted glue. And I used a paintbrush to kind of spread that around. And then that I used, uh, uh, to hold the, the static grass in place. Always, always, without doubt, do the scenery before you plant the buildings. Rule number one. And now I've added some full strength white glue so I can glue the buildings in place on the base. And now there they set. So it's, it's getting towards completion, but we have to find out what the heck that uh, all that uh, aerial work and that I beam is for. And there's this photo here uh, in was in the Northwestern Lines magazine on the Story City Branch uh, article by Bill Armstrong. And if you look off to the left, you'll see what, what's cooking here. Um, bring that up a little better. You can see there's a trolley up on the I beam, and there's a piece of cable hanging down that has a chain fall hooked to it. The chain fall is hooked to uh, uh, some supports, a yoke affair made out of what appears to be angle iron, and that's hooked to a drag conveyor. So this is my attempt at that. Um, I think that uh, I probably spent three hours working on this and more car swear words than I've spent in the, in the last three years. Um, the, the best part was the trolley at the top. Uh, we used to call those uh, finger pinching SOBs at work because to put a trolley, I don't know if you ever put a trolley on an I-beam, but you have to loosen the two sides up and put one set of wheels up on, then the other set of wheels, and then tighten everything back down again. And these things weigh at least 50 pounds and you're always working over your head. And to that, I glued a piece of thread um, the, the actual uh, chain falls is nothing more than an, a, a skinny and a little bit whiter piece of um, threaded rod that I sliced off, painted red. Uh, the thicker piece, I drilled a couple of holes in and put a U-shaped piece of wire in. 
the real problem was with the chain. I'd get it glued on and it would break. I'd get fix the break and the glue would come loose. I almost really almost gave up and started over again. The the loop on the right or the left, excuse me, actually broke in two. I had to try and glue that back together again. But anyway, the, the chain goes from one side of the of the top piece under the, uh, the the skinny piece at the bottom and back up to the other side of the top piece. And then there's a hook fastened to that that goes in a hole in that angle iron yoke. I used the air reservoir from a split K brake system uh, for the motor. I don't know if that's where the motor would go or not, but that's where I put it. Um, and I drove a hole in the end, added a piece of uh, wire, and hit that with a silver magic marker. That's how I I did the the drags on the on the belt too was with silver magic marker. <coughs> uh, this view you can see I sliced another chunk of that uh, threaded rod off and glued it under the drag, and then wrapped a piece of uh, uh, thread it around uh, the motor shaft and that to act as either a drive belt or uh, or chain. I figured being I spent so much time and, and so, so many good swear words, I was going to take plenty of pictures of this. Here you can see the, I used a piece of uh, low sound uh, decoder wire that was orange and I painted it black and made it long enough to reach from that pole I put on the back to the other end and then rolled it back up and glued it on by the motor there. Now, when I put everything in place, the, the ground cover on this base has to match the ground cover on the layout. And there was a road going up to this end of it. So I decided that I better put a door on the end. And again, the door is made the same way the other one is, piece of car siding, uh, 20 by 20 piece with a piece over the top of that. Now this one, I did not paint. It was, everything was white. And I just used dry brushed uh, some rust and some uh, gray on it for wear. Um, being that I did this while it was in place, I didn't get the height right. It's about four feet off the ground. So when I made the platform that goes under it, um, I made that three feet off the ground and that used some, uh, again, some car siding, some two by eights maybe, and a couple of pieces, three pieces of threaded rod for the posts and a piece of Central Valley uh, stairs. And I used a piece of probably 10 by 25 thousandths as a, as a bumper between the, that distance from where the, the door should be and where it is. And that's all there is. Thank you very much. How long did that take, by the way? No answer. Uh, it looks like it took about, uh, what is it, 6.56 now, so about 25, 25 minutes or so. Excellent. Great. Yeah, nice job. Any, any questions? Nice work, Clark. Hmm. <clears throat> no questions, so put it away. It seems so familiar to me. What was that? Could you repeat because that? Because you were paying attention last I said week. It and... seems so familiar to me. I was paying a lot of attention. <laughs> yeah, Clark just had a few more photos than I shared last week. So When you were not available, Clark, last last week, I shared a few of the photos I had of the the same. Yeah, facility. I saw that. I, I I looked at it later. Yeah, that was good stuff. Yep. Yeah. So, but you did a great job, and you had a couple more photos that I had not seen, particularly the the aerial from Mart. That's yeah. That's from we go down to Iowa City. Uh, Jason and I have been down there twice now. I think we'll probably go some more. And uh, if you look at the Minnesota uh, Historical Society's website, they have 
the Minnesota Vincent Mark aerials, and they're all online. You can look at the pictures. They're small, you can keep them, but they're not very big, but you can buy bigger images. Iowa, unfortunately, all of the original photos are still in the original um, uh, folders, and you have to go into the society, you have to make an appointment, you have to show up, you have to have a list of what you want to see, and then they'll go pull it. They only go pull these things three times a day, four at the most. So you need to know what all the towns are you want to look at, and then they'll go bring them down and you can go through, but you can't do anything with these photos other than take pictures of them yourself. You can't copy them, you can't do anything. So you just take along a cell phone and uh. make sure the battery's up. And that's what, uh, I think that's probably what, what where this photo, excuse me if I can get to it here, not using a mouse too far. This photo is probably cropped from the original photo. That would have been, because you sure. can see this was, this was part of the lumberyard complex. You can see the actual lumberyard building where I've got the V-Mart uh, credit and their office mm -hmm. and probably scale there in the lower left. But the elevator would be to the right, upper, upper right corner. And that's about all there yeah. was there in town. And I've never modeled this because on my layout, you're always looking north and all this stuff's on the south side of the track. And to go to all the trouble to build this thing, I want people to see it. I don't want to I just see the back part of it. And I didn't do the back anyway. Clark, uh, a friend of mine lives in Oklahoma and he said he's, he watched the, uh, uh, the uh, YouTube of it. He said that they had a building very similar to that down there in the fertilizer business. And they oh, had, a, sure. had a, uh, a, an a piece of an elevator that slipped under the car which loaded the, the vertical elevator that's, well, uh, I guess you call it a vertical elevator that dumped it into the building. Yeah, you know, I that's the normal way of doing it. You know, the Walther's uh, coal elevator, they come with two sections. But yeah, they would, my thought is, pure speculation, of course, is, um, is they either had something you know, there's that kind of, that walkway that goes along there, like a sidewalk. <laughs> this thing could have moved ahead wheels at the bottom of this elevator, and it could have went, uh, rolled across on that, and they had something that would have went under a hopper. The other, the other thought <laughs> is that they, they put the end of this conveyor in a gondola, and then just shoveled onto it and dumped it into the bed. One of the two, I, I have no idea which. That would have worked what you're talking about, yeah. Yep. When it's Either way. With a lot of hopper, or a lot of gondolas. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, or it would have been either ways. way. Yeah, it could have done it either way. I plan on... Uh, and they could even have... Stuck. Yep. And they could have even put it into the door of a boxcar if a boxcar of coal showed up. Yep. Yes, sir. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah, this is that photo. With the with the open compartment <laughs> there, I can make this. Bigger. Yeah, unfortunately, somebody put that caboose in the way, and you can't see what's going on. Yeah, that I always worry. You know, you wonder, and all of a sudden, one day, I happen to notice that and say, "Ha ha, that's how they what they did." <laughs> yeah. So the the trolley, you know, was to move that conveyor back and forth along the the length of the building to whichever bend they won the load. And it, it, it's still, I'm so confused by where the, the, the pickup point is on that conveyor. You would think in order to be able to lift it up and lower it into those roof slots, they should be picking it up by the very end. But they're mm -hmm. not, they're picking it up more toward the bottom than they are towards the top. So I don't, you'd almost have to have somebody standing on the bottom of it in order, or somebody walking along on the roof uh, you know, because this thing has got to clear all those supports when they're moving it along. So it's a lot of questions that are, remain unanswered here for sure. Unless it was somehow fastened to that sidewalk in some way, 
yeah you know with a, with a rod or a hinge or something because i do know in that concrete platform that it that is standing there there are bolts sticking up from the concrete like there was something bolted to that edge of that concrete slab at one time yeah i don't know if we can look at that yeah picture i had up toward the yeah one of the pictures i took shows some bolts sticking up and it's like this one what was bolted on that on that slab yeah you can't the only thing i can think of is some kind of uh it looks like you can see some stuff here uh, yeah. you know like there's a, a wall across there to keep that coal from falling back this direction because well, that, that may be what photo, you, yeah yeah like railroad ties or something across there i can't tell yeah yeah massage yeah, that the aerial photo shows around. some wing walls coming out from the towards the south end yeah i saw that yep and then the coal is pouring out that end but yep. this is i think a different elevator but i can't be sure well that one looks like it could be raised at the top of that the motor looks quite far down on the yeah. elevator yeah because on the other one you, the the that part of that elevator was exposed and you couldn't see a motor there yeah 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 this is i don't know what this is probably five six years later this photo from the from the top photo or from the well many years later because that uh that that photo by armstrong would have been in during the war years and this is yeah that was about 47 or 48. yeah and this one here is probably in the 60s i was going to say 60s with the co-op feed logo there yeah. and i think the fe is maybe fertilizer i'm sure that's what it yeah they have converted it from coal over the fertilizer as needs have changed yeah yeah everything has progressed yeah because they've changed you know they've closed in the openings on the side and put in those small square hatches closed mm -hmm. in the roof openings and because they're using that auger to just convey fertilizer up inside yeah mm -hmm. anyway i've been wanting to make this ever since i first saw that photograph so it's done yeah it's done yeah. in carlberg waiting for the next op session yeah. yeah, shame shame Roger's not here tonight because he he has been as curious as the rest of us about well, how you can this, watch this tomorrow or yeah. the next day. I'll pass that on to him. Yeah, he just yeah because he's as puzzled as you and I are about how this was constructed, how it functioned. And it probably didn't work that well. That's why we never saw any more of them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, and then they did go to a hell of a lot of trouble they when did. most of them just had a dory open and shoveled the coal in, you know. Yeah. Yes, somebody uh, somebody had an idea, and they they actually went a long way to realizing it, but it doesn't look like it worked very well. Yeah, no, it was it labor intensive to move that? I'm sure. I'm looking at this picture, and that you see that thing that looks kind of like a spider at the bottom of the black. That uh, is, I'm assuming that's the motor yeah. mounted up above. So yeah. you think that's the same thing that you modeled, right? That it's kind of off to the side now. Yeah, on on the, what I modeled was been from that other photo. Yeah, wherever that's at. Now here further, too far. For no, not far enough. I'm not using a mouse, so I'm having this photo here. Right. Whoop! I lost it. I got it too big. Yeah, you can see here, that thing would have been down here. Right. And this is held up up here and you can't see a motor. I just put a motor in there because I had to put it somewhere and it, yeah. I could, I could, it would set in between my the yoke that I made. Yeah. So you've not been able to find a, a local Methuselah that could give you some information? I don't know. The problem is these little bergs down there are so small. Um, I, your best bet would be to go to look at the the, the books, histories of the counties. Uh, I doubt if there's any books on McCallsburg itself, 
but you might find something at a county directory or a county book. Yeah, Roger and I actually talked to the guy who now owns the buildings and the property, and uh, he didn't have any clear knowledge. He's probably just a little bit younger than we are. Yeah. Uh, just had no clue of what had been, which was unfortunate. And he couldn't couldn't steer us to anybody who might know who was, you know, someone who had worked there at one time and was still alive. So. Yep, so it remains a mystery, but I'm, I've done what I can do. I got one of my colleagues who out there when he was about 15, and he knew all this stuff. He was talking to parents and grandparents and that sort of thing. So there's different sources of information that can uh, open, open up doors for us to handle this. Not hearing you real well, Rich. Huh. Okay, I will unshare. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you very much, Clark. You're welcome. Thank you. Nice job. Yeah, very Next nice. Time wow. We'll do, we'll do, you know, the last uh, virtual RPM, the hindsight 2020. Um, Chris Yanko of, uh, or Vanko of Chicago area. He did a presentation on uh, doing a Chad Boas uh, flat car, and he went into great detail. So I was inspired by that. So there's a box car that I just built, and I took a lot more photos of it than I normally would. So maybe next time we get come around, you need somebody, I can show you the pictures of how I built that car. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's see what I got here. All right. Uh, well, it is uh, seven ten here. D uh, Ron, do you want to present a little on the, uh, the open wire phone systems you were talking about? Okay, I got to unmute myself. There you go. <laughs> now I've got to uh, find my. Uh, let's see here. I got a new pair of glasses, which I work real well, except I can't see through them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will, uh, let's see what I got to do. See, I've already forgot what I'm doing here. I got to get it open. I didn't think I had it in PowerPoint. I guess I do. So, okay. You know, speaking of forgetting, I had to go to uh, be a pallbearer at a funeral this morning. And uh, it was for a coworker. And another guy that used to work there uh, was there. And I said, hi, Dick, how you doing? And he looked at me and says, I don't remember you. And, you know, there's, there's dumb and dumber. And then Dick is dumbest. He's not a bright, bright person. <laughs> and... Uh, um, later on, we, we went for lunch and he was sitting across from me and he looked at me and he says, you used to be a lot thinner, didn't you? I said, yes, didn't we all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I found this. The, uh, this is chapter one. Now all I got to do is figure out how to do a screen share and stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Now there's something up here that you do that uh, you get the full screen. Let's see. Play from current slide. 
No, just hit the top one, play from current slide. That should take you to full, there you go. Okay. Uh, this is really, uh, uh, to begin with, kind of a history of my, uh, my work history. But you know, so many of us don't model the telephone lines that come to our house. And um, a lot of us model in the 50s. And in 1959, we still were using Magneto Telephone in Tama. And I'll tell you, a lot of places in Iowa was still using Magneto Telephone because Iowa, a lot of uh, the small telephone companies were Iowa owned by the same guy. So I'm not going to read all of this, but it really talks about how things are really got started with nothing but barbed wire. And uh, it only required one wire. And the, uh, the other side of it was uh, a uh, ground rod and you had to keep the ground rod wet in order to hear it all. And uh, it, this would of course be party lines. A party line would be, could be any number of people because everybody got a phone call by ring. Ours was short and long, for example. And uh, when you wanted to talk to the operator, you uh, turned to crank a good long ring and the operator at the other end would uh, pick up the line and uh, ask you who you wanted to talk to. And, you know, it was really convenient because if you wanted to talk to the doctor, why she said, you know, Doc Fee isn't in today, you'll have to go to Doc Maplethorpe. Or uh, she would uh, call about uh, conversations with uh, uh, what was being on sale. So it was kind of interesting. It's hard to see here, but there's actually a wire up here above the fence. And I'm sure that that's in fact a, uh, a piece of barbed wire uh, for them talking to the left. You see how they uh, just wrapped a piece of leather around the pole and uh, to insulate it. And over here on the other side, you'll see some on the fence line. And then there's a little history of the telephone. You know, it started 1876 and by 1878, why they were starting to have telephone service all over the country. <laughs> Magneto system is of course run by one wire and uh, everything east of town was on that Magneto system. And uh, in 59, why uh, my friend and I I saw an ad in the paper, they were putting dial telephone in the in Tama. So we said, well, you know, why not? So we went up and they hired us for uh, unpacking boxes and so forth like that. And when Magneto, uh, when we were done, why they put the service in, put, put it in service. And now at that point it was common battery, meaning it had to have two wires. So the key to that is if you're going to model it, if you're Magneto, you're going to have one wire. If you're common battery, which of course we have today, uh, before fiber optics, you're going to have to have two wires per telephone line. Now you can have up to 10 parties on a line and they, the way they ring today, they ring on a frequency. And uh, I don't think there's many party lines left anymore, but uh, the frequencies, there are a number of different ones, but the ones we most saw was 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 cycle. The problem with whoever got the 60 cycle telephone, uh, his phone usually jingled all the time because they were, the line was underneath the electric line and there was enough transfer of the uh, power from the electric line that it rang the bell all the time. So that was one thing you didn't want and that was one of the first ones that they would get rid of is a 60 cycle. And of course you could do it on both sides because you could ring on the what they call the tip side of the line or you could ring on the ring side of the line and those two uh, terms come from the plug that the operator uses when she plugs into the switchboard. I know that's more than you really want to know, but anyway, oh. so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the lines here. So if, and we'll get into the common battery where you had two lines. So if you put this in, you can't just have two lines running down the pole line forever and ever because you'll start getting uh, uh, Cross, cross talk and all kinds of uh, problems with that. So what they did is they twisted the wire. So that's what you're seeing over here is a twist in the wire in order to get rid of that. And you see that today in uh, our DCC systems, people talk about that. 
Also in Ethernet. Yeah, twisted yeah. pairs. Same thing. When you have parallel wires, why well, you get that common problem. So on each one of these, there's the uh, uh, the uh, address of a website that would, might be, if you want to find out more about it, you can look at that. And here's some pictures of the old poles. I like the one on the right. It shows two brackets. Oh. It would just be a line, one line going out. Of course, there's the guy in the middle. He shinnied up the pole. He looks like that guy might have had hooks, although I had a friend that when he started, he actually just, they just shinnied up the pole. Oh. So that's uh, the, that's the end of the, oh, okay. Now we get into the magneto system. Whoops, I'll start. That's the end of that one. Uh, I, I broke these up into chapters, so. That was good. Uh, that's my, uh, if at, my, uh, at my relative's uh, lake house in, in uh, uh, southern Minnesota, they had, oh, I don't know, about six cabins. And, and every cabin had a, a hand-cranked telephone line. And, and every cabin was had a number. And if you, wanted to, if you were at cabin one and wanted to talk to cabin five, you would crank the thing five times. And somebody would pick up on the other end. Oh yeah, that's that's the way it worked. Now let's see. All I got to do is try to find where number two is. Okay, that's number three. I've been working on number three, but uh, I don't have it done. And if I can't find number two, the program is over today and you'll have to watch it again another day. Okay. Ah, well, guess what? Chapter three. I didn't think we were going to get to this, so I just bothered to uh, have everything in order. If anybody has trifocals, they understand how the bottom one. You know, while you're looking there, a story with the old phones. My grandparents on the farm, they had the wooden box on the wall with the, with the, again, you would crank. And there was a party line. And my grandmother always used to talk about the other ladies listening in when somebody was calling her. One day when I was staying down there, I come running in the kitchen and she's standing next to the phone with her hand over the mouthpiece and the, and the other part to her ear listening in on somebody else's <laughs> conversation. <Yeah. laughs> that was real common, really common for that to happen. Uh, yeah, than a newspaper. <laughs> Do you see back that? In the, back in the day, we called those rubber neckers. <laughs> <laughs> My mother tells a story of when I was about four years old that I would listen in on the party lines, <laughs> and I would get scolded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does anybody see that? Yes. 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 All right. Says pole lines, chapter two, hardware. Yeah. Is it play? Yeah, if I can figure it out. There you go. All right. There you got it. <clears throat> this is probably more important to us because the first was just a little bit of history. Now you can really see some of the things that we would have to do if we were going to model this. Believe me, telephone. Uh, was around so that we all should really be modeling it. Now, I'm not going to go into the big deal with telephone poles. You can read this later. Uh, but you don't confuse electric poles with telephone poles because they are much taller. And uh, you can see the different sizes and so forth like this. And if somebody needs this, uh, I can do it on a daily basis where you can read it a little bit better. But 
this actually probably wasn't meant to be something that uh, you'd take to a clinic because there's too much uh, information. So there a typical six pin cross arm. Remember all of these have got to have two wires in order to make it work. So everything will be a, either a, a two pin, four pin, six pin, up to a 10 pin cross arm. So I've uh, picked up a few uh, uh, different uh, photographs here. The one with six pin and the one on the right with the four pin and a six pin on top. And then I, the pins are evenly spaced, 11 and a quarter inches apart. The first pin out from the center of the arm is 11 inches. This allows 22 inches for a worker to climb up through the middle of one of these cross arms because it's, if you really start modeling the old uh, railroad stuff, it's not unusual to have five or six cross arms on a, uh, on a pole. So the one on the left is kind of interesting because they've uh, managed to put everything, let's see if I get my mouse over here. Maybe I don't have a mouse anymore. Well, I'll just tell you. Okay, the one on the left, you can see it's a, a off center and it probably is because there was trees or a building in the way. So they had to make the, uh, the cross arms extend off to one side. And you'll find all kinds of different uh, contraptions that they come up with to, uh, to, to offset these or make them common. And on the left-hand side, or I'm, I don't know my left or my right tonight. On the right-hand side, you'll see that thing marked A. That's a transposition. That's where the wires cross each other so that you don't have uh, uh, two parallel uh, wires. And uh, the C would be your metal straps to hold your uh, cross arms up, you need those. And uh, in some cases, like on D, that's an angle iron. So I wondered how these cross arm braces were. They were 30 inches long. They were made out of galvanized steel. And if you do decide to put up a line and uh, put wire on them, I, a lot of us put up telephone poles or electric poles without any wire on it. But if you do, I found that if you use the down guy, like as shown in the right-hand side, uh, you get far less damage to your, to your uh, line when people hit it the thing that happens more often is they just uh, knock the wire off of the off the pole, but it generally doesn't take anything down. And that guy wires, you know, always used when the telephone line makes a, a change in direction or at the end of the line. And the, uh, the stuff that uh, that wire that goes down is a 10 M strand and that's heavy stuff. That's a very high tensile wire. So here's a bunch of brackets. Uh, the, uh, the one on the right is pretty old and the others are brand new that they been in, and they are threaded. And that's why you can turn your, uh, the insulator down onto the bracket to hold them in place. And then they, some of them are nailed in, some of them are uh, screwed in. There's a number of ways they attach, attach them to a pole. And when you get into, insulators, there is an unbelievable amount of insulators and they, some of them are really quite expensive. I, uh, of course, uh, working for the telephone company, I had opportunity to pick some of those up and I did pick them up. And uh, then I threw them away and picked them up again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now I've been collecting them to some degree, but if they get over three or $4, why that's too expensive for me, I, I forget it. But I did find one the other day from the Canadian Pacific Railroad. And I think I paid five bucks for that. And I told the guy, I said, do you really know what you got here? And he said, I don't know. I said, that's a CP, that's Canadian Pacific Railroad. When I went by, he had another one. When I went by the second time, it was $10. <laughs> so I think he, he learned a bit there. My, uh, 
my hunting buddy in Pennsylvania found this one next to the Bessemer in Lake Erie. And it's got a, a patent date of October 8th, 1907 on it. Yeah, you can find these way back in the 1800s. Uh, and it's, I tell you, almost everybody who made glass made insulators because there's millions and millions of them out there. And uh, you can see on the left here, some of the different colors. They, there were even some two-tone. And there was a lot of clear, a lot of the green. Uh, there was one that we picked up the other day that is really a bright green. It's really pretty. And I've saw them in red and I've saw them in yellow, uh, just all kinds of them. So I'll ask you, if, would you know, this? these are so short, I could put them out on a daily basis. Would that be, because there's so much verbiage in there, would that be of interest to anybody? Oh, it's been fascinating, Ron. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll, what I'll do is I'll put them, the chapters are all going to be small like this. So uh, they could easily be put out on a PowerPoint. Then you can read them at your leisure. It, it's hard to do it when you get on a YouTube. So I'll, I'll start doing that over the next few days. And uh, that's uh, all I have. I'm not going to show number three. <laughs> Let's save that. All right. Well, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Clark. And uh, we're at 728. So that'll be that'll do it for tonight. I think uh, next week we're on right and then it's week after that we're all going, or a lot of us are going. No, to... We're gone next week. Is it next week? Okay, yeah, I got my weeks confused. So maybe we'll skip next week. And we'll be back uh, the following. So let's see, next week's the 19th. So we'll come back on the 26th. Hopefully we'll have some reports on Indianapolis for those yeah. of us who can't go. Yeah, definitely. So uh, how's that sound? Good enough. All I'm right, very good. There on Wednesday. Yep. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to be down there till Friday night. And, and uh, so I'll probably see you guys Saturday morning. But <laughs> uh, anyway, we look forward to that. And thanks, Clark. Thanks, Ron. It was a fun night. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. Good night. Bye-bye.